Good afternoon, everyone, and good morning and good evening. Um, I'm pleased today to introduce John Taylor of the British Museum, who will be talking today on the judgment of the dead on ancient Egyptian coffins. Now, judgment of, after death was one of the most difficult ordeals an ancient Egyptian had to face before entering the afterlife. It involved a confession of innocence before 42 divine judges and the weighing of the heart in a balance to assess the owner's moral character. Dr. Taylor's lecture will be the threshold of eternity, the judgment of the dead as represented on ancient Egyptian coffins. And for those of you that don't know um, John, he is the assistant keeper or curator of Egyptian art at the British Museum and arguably one of the great experts on coffins. And before we go into the lecture, I'd just like to talk a little bit about Dr. Taylor. He received his PhD in Egyptology from the University of Birmingham in 1985 and joined the British Museum in 1988. His main area of expertise is the funerary archeology span of Pharaonic Egypt with particular focus on coffins of the New Kingdom, third intermediate period and the late period. Now, within this field, he conducts research into the dating and evolution of coffins and focuses on the paleographic and stylistic evidence to better understand the working environments in which coffins were produced. He has also been closely involved with the non-invasive study of mummies using CT scanning and 3D visualization techniques. His wider research interests include the history and prosopography of the third intermediate period, metal statuary and its manufacture, and the early history of the British Museum's Egyptian collection. His current projects uh, concern the catalog of coffins and cartonnage cases of the 22nd and 23rd dynasties. And he's also editing with Marie Vandenbusch a multi-authored volume, Ancient Egyptian Coffins, Craft Traditions and Functionality. Um, this, these are the proceedings of an international colloquium that was held at the British Museum in 2014. And one project that I am particularly interested in, he is also participating in the study of organic residues on coffins, cartonnage cases and mummies in collaboration with Margaret Serpico and others. This lecture is presented in conjunction with the 2023 exhibition Life and the Afterlife, Ancient Egyptian Art from the Sunusrit Collection. It is a lecture sponsored by the Forward Arts Foundation, Dr. Ira and Mrs. Linda Rampel, Sandra Still and Emily Catt. So with, oh, and one piece of, of housekeeping before, we, before uh, John gets started. Uh, please, if you have any questions for Dr. Taylor, please write them in the Q&A and I will go ahead and, um, and, and moderate the questions uh, for um, Dr. Taylor. Thank you. Thank you, Melinda. And thank you for inviting me to speak at this. Um, one of the most famous images from ancient Egypt is this, the weighing of the heart from the papyrus of Ani in the British Museum. For the Egyptians, a person's heart was the center of his being, his mind and his consciousness held a record of his life on earth. And by weighing the heart against the image of truth, here represented as feather, the gods could determine whether its owner deserved to pass on to eternal life. It shows us that in the 13th century BC, the Egyptians had evolved the concept of personal accountability. The idea that one's acts in life could determine one's state after death and that reward or punishment would follow. It is, of course, an idea which recurs in other religions. But unlike the long awaited communal judgment day of Judeo-Christian tradition, the ancient Egyptian expected to face his gods alone and individually and within a short time of death. Here I want to trace the evolution of this image, how it's represented on painted coffins of the first millennium BC, and what role it plays in the mortuary world, which is folk. Looking at the pyramids of Giza, 
perhaps the most labor intensive tombs ever constructed, and the burial treasures of Tutankhamun, it's easy to assume that the ancient Egyptians were obsessed with death. It's an assumption that most Egyptologists are anxious to oppose on the grounds that the evidence is unbalanced. The sources for burial practices have far outweigh those for life experience. But there is no doubt that between about 2500 BC and Egypt's absorption into the Roman Empire in 30 BC, the inhabitants of the Nile Valley left more writings about death and its consequences than any other people of the ancient world. Egyptian texts and images reflect many different approaches to death, both positive and negative. Among negative views, death is as a dissociation, emberment of the body, dispersal of the constituent elements of the person. It can be seen as social isolation, separation from family and social group and as the great enemy, the violation of harmony and order. These views are counterbalanced by interpretations of death as transition, return, and mystery. Uh, by mystery, I mean having access in and initiation into a divine realm unknown to people uh, in the living world. Now, of course, these are the attitudes of a small literary elite, probably not more than 5% of the population of Egypt at most. But how the peasants in the field imagine death, we can never really know. Within the framework of their religious beliefs, the Egyptians' response to death was to refuse to accept it as the end of existence. They accommodated it into their worldview by treating it as a threshold, a transition to a further stage of the human experience. Relatively secure in the stable environment of the Nile Valley, they were constantly aware of the repeating cycles of the natural world. Motions of sun, moon and stars, the annual Nile flood, the growth and death of vegetation. They found everywhere metaphors for birth, death and rebirth. So as an integral part of creation, why should not human life also be renewable? To ensure rebirth, certain prescribed patterns of behavior have to be observed. Just as the gods must be placated with the performance of regular rituals in the temples, the dead were treated as godlike beings and became the focus of ritual and cult activities, which grew increasingly elaborate over time. Death was followed by a period of mourning with public expressions of lamentation, while the deceased underwent a process of transformation physical body was cleansed and reconstituted as a divine image, a noble body, a which we call mummy. It was conducted in procession to the tomb on the day of burial, with more displays of grief, and subjected to rituals under the life-giving rays of the sun. The crucial ritual, the opening of the mouth, seems to reanimate the person and reconnect the elements of his being, both non-physical and physical. The sense organs in the face, eyes, as well as the mouth, were symbolically opened by contact with magically charged implements, drawing the person's faculties and consciousness. The individual being was recreated. And he was reintegrated into the structured hierarchical world in which his status was an important part of his identity. Hulk was established to, at his tomb to provision him and supply his material needs. He could now enter the next world. He had entered the realm of higher beings, gods and divine entities, both benevolent and possible. Um, and this journey is often illustrated in books of the dead. Uh, you see gods guarding gateways to the beyond, the dead person confronting hostile creatures like crocodiles, escaping from a net to make sure that he free access to the next world. Very important was for the dead to demonstrate their worthiness in order to gain access to the world and to meet the gods face. They would need to prove their mastery of sacred knowledge their ability to use magical powers. This would enable them to gain free access and avert disaster. 
order to reach the two green gods Osiris and Re, and enter the eternal paradise field of reeds. And this is how uh, in the Papyrus of Arni, the, the field of reeds, the kind of perfect version of Egypt as an agricultural paradise, is great. Observation of ritual and possession of sacred knowledge were at all times important, but this was not all. Personal integrity was also crucial. Living according to principles of accepted good conduct proved by the gods. The principles are known from quite early records, collections of maxims or instructional literature dating back to the age of the pyramids. Such positive speeches are put into the mouths of the dead in autobiographical texts inscribed in tombs and on healing. Uh, you see some examples on the screen. These declarations are often addressed to the living, people who would visit the tomb, the aim being to persuade them of the dead man's good character so that they might speak the ritual words which would magically renew the supply of provisions. At this point, personal probity is not yet a fixed requirement for attaining the afterlife, although bad conduct could result in its loss. Uh, we have a, a, a statement that there is no tomb for the rebel. Someone who rebels against authority won't have an afterlife. The culmination of this evolving idea is a concept of the judgment of the dead. Ultimately, it took the form of a review of a person's life to determine whether they should enter paradise or not. The concept was founded on the model of a court of law, an institution of fundamental importance in ancient society. There were local courts and higher courts with the king as the supreme earthly authority. But the gods could also be called upon to give judgments, even in seemingly minor cases. There is abundant evidence that uh, in texts that litigation was thought to be also death. The coffin text, Middle Kingdom, around 2000 BC, refer to the deceased in several situations. Letters written to the dead by the living asking for their help also hint at it. In this early period, the deceased faces an opponent, frequently a hostile accuser. Such litigations also feature in the myths of the gods most famously in the mythology of Iris, Horus, and Seth. Indication is the positive outcome that is sought. In these earlier sources, indication of the judgment after death is seen as the means of restoring the dignity of the dead person and re-establishing him in the social context. As such, it is a counterpart to the restoration of the physical person mummification and divisioning. The Egyptologist Jan Asman, who has studied these texts in depth, has summarized this in the, in the, in the sentence, indication was moral mummification. In other words, the judgment of the dead was a crucial part of the rebirth. However, the early dis descriptions of these judgment scenarios do not yet include the notion of accounting for one's life. It's unclear exactly when that idea developed. It's often been suggested that one of the earliest references is in the instruction for Mary Carre, a wisdom text addressed by a king to his successor, probably composed in the Middle Kingdom in the early second millennium BC. The scenario is that of a tribunal of the gods which man faces after death. Trust not in the length of the years. They view a lifetime as but an hour. When a man remains over after landing at death, deeds are set to strike him as a sum. Being there last forever, fool is he who does what they prefer. He who reaches them without sin will be there as a god, striding freely like the lords of eternity. So the review of one's life concept is here in an embryonic form, but not yet the idea of freeing oneself from sin. That emerges. First clear references to the fully developed concept come towards the end of the Middle Kingdom, 
13th dynasty, about 1720 BC, with the emergence of a spell mentioning the heart and the balance. The dead person speaks to his heart, do not oppose me as a witness, do not oppose me in the tribunal, do not lean against me in the presence of the balance. The text is inscribed on scarab-shaped amulets, which sometimes have a human head to emphasize the close connection between a person's heart and his individual identity. About 200 years later, in the New Kingdom, this spell was incorporated into a repertoire of magical and ritual texts. The Egyptians named the spells for going out by day. That is, spells which ensured that the beneficiary would live again and move freely from his tomb to receive the life-giving rays of the sun. Of course, we call this collection the Book of the Dead. The Book of the Dead is a repertoire of words of rituals and collections of sacred knowledge, which equips the person with magical power. Among its approximately 200 spells is the one just mentioned, the longer one, number 125, plus the now famous image of the judgment. These sources provide the fully articulated picture of the Egyptian judgment of the dead. In this conception, he must account for his life before the supreme judge, usually Osiris, the god who survived death to become ruler of the underworld. But sometimes the judge is Re, the sun god, who crosses the sky by day in his boat and by night journeys through the underworld, and like Osiris, experiences a regeneration. These two gods are both distinct entities and also a unity. By night, it was believed that they met and merged and were regenerated in the form that you see here, ram-headed, uh, mummy-shaped. And in this regeneration, they channel the power to renew all life on Earth. The two spells, 30B and 125, together with the image that you were just seeing, give the details of the judgment. It takes place in a hall of audience, somewhere in the undefined regions beyond the earthly realm. Exact location is not specified. This place is named the Hall of the Two Marks, that's two goddesses who personify what is right or true. Mark is the principle by which the correct behavior is judged, both in earthly court and in the divine tribunal. And on this early image, you see the two figures of Mark, the female figures at the top, of the, uh, the image there. The deceased enters the hall and speaks to 42 judges, each by name. That's a demonstration of his knowledge, which gives him power. And to them, he has to deny guilt of a whole list of sins. The assessors are fearsome monsters, names suggestive of their role as punishers. Baker of bones, eater of entrails, strange, frightening names. And the sins that he must deny are a, a mixture of crimes against humanity, uh, society, and the gods. By making these declarations of innocence, he um, separates himself from acts which would bring down divine punishment. Knowledge of the correct form of words ensures a positive outcome. Personal character is now tested on the balance. Anubis, supervisor or lord of the balance, weighs the heart against an image of art, here shown as a feather. Heart embodies the person, the seat of the intelligence, and contains a record known as life. If the heart and mart are in equilibrium, the life has been well spent. And the god Thoth, the ibis headed figure here with the scribal. It declares his deeds are righteous in the great balance and no sin has been found in him. Then we have the great company of gods that you see at the top here. They announce the consequence. Let there be given to him the offering which are issued in the presence of Osiris. May a grant of land be established in the field of offering. The paradise looking forward to going to. Balance is a metaphor for accuracy. 
The balance that is depicted in the judgment is exactly like that used for weighing precious metals, such as gold, a pure and divine substance. At the top left there, you can see an image from a tomb painting showing gold rings being weighed. Both types of balance incorporate an image of Mart, the little female head that you see on top of the central pole in both of these weighing schemes. And this is a visual metaphor which has come down to our own day. Tales of justice held by a female figure. Having passed this test, the deceased is conducted to Osiris. He is declared Maheru, true of voice. His triumph is graphically represented in later images by his upraised arms and being adorned with feathers, emblem of Mart. There on the right, you've got uh, Lady Anhai, um, who's in this gesture of jubilation because she's passed through the judgment safely. Um, and in these uh, papyrus uh, books of the dead, many of them are, are made for women as well as men. Uh, both of them go through the same procedure towards eternal life. The role of the harp here is twofold. It embodies the person, one of the keperu, the component elements of a person's being, reunited by mummification. But in the Hall of Judgment, the dead person does not have total control over his heart. And the spell 30b that we've been looking at alludes to the alarming possibility that the heart might speak from the balance, revealing to the gods its own sins. Bell is designed to prevent this. The fear is very real because if the dead person is found wanting, handed over to Amut, devourer, creature that's partly crocodile, partly lion, partly hippo, that is waiting by the balance to devour him uh, and devour his heart, uh, if the weighing doesn't. Here, for the first time, is the clear distinction between reward for life lived well and punishment for life lived badly. And it raises an interesting question. Are the principles enshrined in these spells used simply as magical knowledge to avert disaster? The weapons with which the deceased can circumvent punishment by the god? Or do they represent the emergence of a true ethical code of behavior for all men to follow? If it's the latter, then this is a turning point in human history. Uh, certainly Jan Asman favored this view, pointing out evidence that some Egyptians tried to live by these principles. Um, I'm not denying this, but the viewpoints of course are not mutually exclusive. Uh, and I would like to try to show that the words, and particularly the image of the judgment, were indeed of immense significance as magic to gain eternal life. The spell 125 showing the weighing appears at the moment when the Book of the Dead is created as a physical entity in the sense of the emergence of papyrus book rolls containing funerary texts to be engraved. This happened about the joint reigns of Shepsut and Tuthmosis third around 40 BC. <clears throat> there you see it in the middle of the Moses on the right. And it was a period of strong centralized government, economic prosperity, and rapidly evolving mortuary practice. The period of the famous temples there at uh, Der el Bakri, the lower right. On papyri, the judgment often occupies a central position indicative of importance. As we know, the texts and images are there to equip the deceased with knowledge, to effect the desired outcome through the magical power inherent in the image. The papyrus role is the primary medium for such texts, the one most directly associated with the speaking of the words aloud, the chief way of making it work. For the same reason, the images and texts Began to be placed on the walls of tombs in the New Kingdom. As with the contents of the papyri, this is not only a way of giving the deceased direct access, but also a means of making them eternally effective. 
In New Kingdom tombs, the judgment scene first appears in the reign of Amenhotep III, about 1370. So it's about 100 years after they first appear on the papyri. Uh, on the left there, you can see an early example of the reign of the half in a tomb. Depictions are at first restricted to the weighing scene. But in the following period, they are expanded, both on papyri and tomb walls with scenes of the deceased led to the balance and afterwards conducted to Osiris. In of Osiris, in this scene, we regularly see the four sons of Horus on a large lotus, that one right here. And although these four gods are mostly familiar as the guardians of the body's internal organs, the judgment they play a role more related to the renewal of life. The lotus they stand on refers to the myth, the birth of the sun god as a child from a lotus, merged from the primeval waters of the moon. Lotus in Book of the Dead 125 is sometimes even shown springing from a miniature primeval water, which is what we have in this uh, on the right. Although in spirit form, the deceased gains the power to range into the realm of gods, he is also bound to the tomb where his physical body lies. His spirit, the Ba, depicted as a human-headed bird, must reunite with the body at the end of every day. The tomb is the earthly dwelling of an eternally living being, because of the gods. It is the threshold between the worlds of mortals and immortals, a place of transition, an interface, a liminal zone. The judgment also represents transition, also a liminal phase, a place of acceptance or rejection, reward or punishment, eternal bliss or agonizing damnation. Both possibilities this time. The dead person's passage into the life is conceived as a journey, but all the while he remains physically in one spot in the tomb. The tomb then functions as his personal cosmos. The conceptual, it's, it's an infinitely expandable soul. Within it, all of the divine realm is potentially accessible, including the Hall of Judgment. Uh, the scene in the middle there is a reconstruction of Queen Nefertari in the Valley uh, Queen. So it's apt that the words and images are placed in the tomb. In a richly appointed tomb like Ari's, they are distributed in different media and locations. Some texts on the walls, some on coffins, some on stele, some on papyrus, some on the mummy's shroud, some on canopy jars, some on amulets and figurines. All these different parts of the Book of the Dead um, corpus are complementary, creating a system uh, when they're united in one location. The roles of these different media as vehicles for elements change over time. In the New Kingdom, the judgment is depicted on papyri or tomb walls, not on the coffin which carries words and images that relate to other aspects of the system. At the end of the New Kingdom, this pattern was disturbed and entered a phase of great change. The new decentralized political structure and a drastic weakening of the economy. Coinciding with these developments, burial practices have changed. The custom of producing decorated tombs for the elite virtually ceased. Even the tradition of funerary papyri declined and ultimately came to a halt. In the 21st dynasty, about 1070 to 950 BC, the coffin assumes a more prominent role. Together with the papyrus, it becomes the main carrier of text and image. Alongside the coffin are treated rather like friezes on a tomb wall, or in fact a papyrus roll, having a series of images in dispersed. Texts are usually short and repetition. It's the images that appear the primary store of magical power. The need to economize on space produced a tendency towards miniaturization of images and a deliberate abbreviation of potent spells and vignettes. 
among the themes from the Book of the Dead, which stand out most prominently, the judgment, often located at the end of one of the long sides of the coffin. Here on the lower image, you can see it uh, towards the, the right hand end. Here we've got another two uh, images of this type from the coffins. These judgment scenes reproduce many elements taken from the New Kingdom tradition. There is a significant change of emphasis. The declarations of innocence are rarely included. The being scene has a prominent play. But the emphasis is on celebrating a successful vindication. The triumph of the deceased is gradually he or she raises their arms in the gesture of justification. You can see both of these images, uh, a woman raising her arms at the top right and a man lower left. The devourer is now often moved away from the wake or even omitted altogether, removing even the possibility of damnation to a safe distance. These judgment scenes also reflect the merging of images and concepts. Just a moment ago. Very characteristic of the 21st dynasty is the depiction of the deceased standing by the balance, heart in one hand, and often the two eyes and the mouth in the other. Uh, and you can see this in the top image uh, with the lady on the left of the balance holding two eyes and her mouth. These scenes are sometimes accompanied by explanatory effect. So in the top one, Osiris says, give to her her eyes and her mouth, for her heart is true. Another example says, receiving your two eyes and your mouth, behold, you entering as one of the praised ones. The restoration of bodily parts, particularly those connected with the senses, is a recurring theme in Egyptian mortuary. The returning of heart and mouth to the deceased is the subject of the spells in the Book of the Dead. Now, these themes are amalgamated into the judgment, and it is implied that this regaining of the senses is a direct consequence of vindication in this test. Next slide will show you two heads of mummies, uh, just to warn you of that. One may consider here the possibility of a conceptual link between the judgment images on these coffins of papyri and some features of the treatment of the mummy. Period. In the 21st dynasty, the embalmers made special efforts to restore full integrity to the body, not only inserting packing material through incisions in the skin to imitate the substance of living flesh, but by replacing the internal organs back to the chest and abdomen after preservation. And most striking of all was the treatment of the eyes. In earlier mummies, like Moses IV, there on the left, the eyelids are closed. In the 21st dynasty, not only are they open, artificial eyes made of stone or glass are inserted, producing a startling effect of animation. This is a visible sign of a person who has passed through judgment, complement to the mummification process. Interestingly, on the coffins of this period, with their strong yellow varnish and brilliant colours, trees of cobras and feathers encircled the top edge of the case. And this makes direct reference to the Hall of Judgment. Of course, it's Mark or Truth, whose emblem is a feather. And in the text, we're told that the walls of the Hall of Judgment are made of living serpents. So this frieze along the top is clearly making reference to uh, the judgment hall. This reminds us that the coffin was not simply a surface for the reception of images. The object as a whole, like the tomb, was a cosmogram, a kind of miniature universe, operating the realm of the beyond. But in uh, the place of judgment was one part. After about 200 years, I mean now about 950 BC, another phase begins with the advent of the 22nd dynasty. This phase is marked by a relatively sudden and dramatic change in the style of coffins. The old yellow varnished style, you will like being met, goes up 
fashion. And now an elite burial assemblage comprised two or three wooden coffins of somber design and simplified decoration. The ones on the right, uh, and these contained at the core mummy enclosed within an envelope of cartonnage, a pliable material made from laminated linen, glue, and plaster. There's an example there on the this envelope brilliantly painted was simultaneously the outer surface of the mummy and the innermost layer of a nest of coffins. And these cases were actually laced together at the back like a shoe. You can see that in the uh, right image there. Not only the physical structure and colouring of the coffin changes, the religious iconography shows the emphasis. The judgment scene almost disappeared for a time. As we will see, the concept is still present and is hinted at in more subtle ways. The decoration now focuses strongly on the relationship between those two great agents of rebirth, Osiris and Re. The images reflect stages in the regeneration, and as in the preceding centuries, elements from different sources material source uh, texts and image are combined and amalgamated. A particular influence is a composition called The Awakening of Osiris and the Transit of the Solar Barks. The Awakening is an example of a sacred book originally composed for the benefit of a deceased king, later adopted into the burials of private individuals. It's first found in a structure built at Abydos by Seti I, as a kind of tomb of Osiris, the Osirean. The same composition was used in some royal tombs in the New Kingdom and significantly in the 22nd dynasty. Well, it consists of a single complex image. Osiris lies on a bed in his tomb, protected from the hostile forces of his enemy set, divine guardians whose figures are ranged on both sides of his bed. He is awakened from his deep of death new life by his son Horus, and is equipped with royal attributes which are depicted in readiness beneath the bed. Uh, bows and arrows, and you've got crowns and royal headdresses. He passes from the confines of the tomb, ascending to the heavens to enter the two barks of the sun god, day and night boats, which make an eternal transit across the sky and through the underworld. The environment of this Osiris tomb with its is recreated in text and image on the coffins of the 22nd dynasty period. Some include exactly the same groups of divine guardian figures who are represented in the awakening. And they may also show a second set of people who are more indirectly associated with tradition. These latter protectors also appear on some cartonnage cases significantly located around the periphery, if shielding the deceased from danger. The figure on the top uh, left there, which I've circled, is one of these divinities. On some cartonnage cases, the image of Osiris awakening on the bed is actually depicted. But in conceptual terms, this image was probably superfluous, since the mummy of the deceased himself played the role of Osiris within the sacred landscape of the ensemble. Note that the royal attributes beneath the bed, the uh, bows and arrows and the other objects, are sometimes depicted uh, actually inside the wooden coffin where the cartonnage was placed, replicating again this layering of different images. Prominent images on the cartonnage relate to the Osiris deceased passage to the sky to take part in the solar journey. The winged figures that you see on the breast there, on the left, are images of the sun god uh, undergoing transformations as he travels across the sky. And occasionally his day and night boats are themselves depicted, uh, as you can see on the right, on the shoulders of this mummy case. This conceptual model has antecedents in mortuary liturgy, uh, texts which date back to the Middle Kingdom. The text represents a ritual scenario in which the body of Osiris is mummified 
and is then protected by divine forces. It lies on the funerary bed during the night before the funeral. It's a moment of vulnerability. Forces of the hostile death might attack. In this version of the regeneration, mummification is followed by the ritual enacting of vindication of the deceased, judgment by the divine tribunal. And this is a preliminary to his entering the sun god's barns. These liturgies make clear that we are dealing with a kind of tripartite process, physical restoration and reanimation of the dead person, then vindication through judgment, and then access to the eternal cycles of the sun god. The canonical image of the awakening and transit in setting the first Sotireion and in the later royal tomb does not actually include an image of judgment. But the coffins of the 22nd dynasty, which adopt the awakening, present visual clues which tell us that the deceased has indeed through judgment. Here's an example. Artenage case, uh, 900 BC. A frequent image is the presentation of the deceased to Osiris or Re, sometimes led forward by Horus or accompanied by Thoth. And you see it there at the top, uh, just below the, uh, the face of the deceased. This scene uh, of presentation is, of course, the conclusion of the judgment, familiar from depictions of the New Kingdom. A further clue is the presence of the four sons of Horus standing on a large lotus floor. You see them there, between Horus and Osiris. And we've already seen that these are characteristic of images of judgment. Positioning of the scene on the breast may also be significant, making a direct connection with the heart of the deceit. A second very telling allusion to the judgment, only found on coffins in this period, is the depiction at the throat of an image encapsulating the idea of vindication. Often it's an image of Marth, the little heated goddess figure. Uh, you see it there on both of those cartonages at the throat. Um, and uh, this, of course, is an image which could be worn around the neck by a person who's just passed through the judgment. Uh, and you see it there on the left, uh, the Lady Anhai, who we saw earlier, is raising her arms. She's passed through judgment. She has hanging on her upper body an image of Marv, very similar to the ones painted on those faces. Um, instead of Mart, sometimes on the throat of the coffin, we see the mythical Enu bird, the soul of Ray. And this is also depicted on heart scarabs or amulets that have L30 dead, one related to the, the weighing of the heart. The position of these Mart and Bennu images on the throat is also interesting because there may be a reference here to speaking. The word that the Egyptians used for uh, justified, indicate Makaru, literally mean true of voice. Of course, the voice comes from the throat, and if you have an image relating to truth in that position, there is a symbolic uh, message here. Uh, it's conveying the idea that the deceased person is true of voice, has been vindicated, they've passed through judgment. Although the judgment has played a crucial role in this regeneration, it's remarkable that on these 22nd dynasty, the most distinctive aspect of the is omitted. The balance scene is hardly ever represented. And on the few examples where it does appear, it's reduced to a small scale and a peripheral location. So the emphasis is not on the process, but on its successful completion. Any elements which could bear negative connotation, list of uh, sins to be denied, or the figure of the devourer, these things are excluded. Even the scene of the balance with its possibility of a bad outcome, avoided as much as possible. Almost as though they're taking extra precautions here to exclude any possibility things may go badly. With the passage of time, this tripartite conceptual model 
in the, became explicitly manifested in the coffin ensembles made for elite individuals in the 25th and 26th dynasties, so in the uh, 8th, 7th and 6th centuries BC. And at this time, the judgment scene enjoys its fullest articulation in the context. This was a period of cultural renewal. The coffins reflect a revival of elements taken from various ancient sources and blended into a conceptual unity. It's a system which can only be fully understood from a study of complete coffin ensembles in which the symbolic meaning of the various component parts can be demonstrated. <clears throat> These sets of coffins usually comprise three elements. The outer coffin is rectangular in shape with a vaulted top and posts at the four corners. This form replicates the appearance of the Osiris tomb, the awakening image. The inner coffin is a fully three-dimensional image of the revivified Osiris, incorporating a plinth and a back pillar so that he possesses the capacity of physical resurrection. The images of protected deities and their speeches which cover the body of the inner coffin on the right here uh, signify that he is still within the scenario of the nocturnal vigil needing protection from a variety of deities. Here's another assemblage of the same type. The middle coffin is the one of most interest to us here. It's mummy shaped but not fully rendered in three dimensions. Its flat base requires that it be positioned lying down. Remember that these coffin sets are representing a three-stage process, with judgment coming between mummification and ascension to the spine. So as we might expect, the middle coffin alludes most strongly to the judgment. On some of the earlier examples, the weighing of the heart is back again, prominently displayed on the lid. And it can appear together with the words of the Declaration of Innocence. All of those columns of hieroglyphs on the lower part here are the, the words of the 42 declarations who are free from sin. Um, here's another rather brilliantly painted example uh, where again you've got the actual weighing of the heart in a band across the breast with Thoth leading the, the person and then Osiris uh, greeting him uh, after Judgment. And again, the lower part of the lid has all these texts, the Declaration of Innocence. And as we move on in time into the 25th, 20th dynasties, these texts and images are transferred from the lid to the exterior walls of the coffin case. The weighing scene at the foot end and the 42 assessors, each with the appropriate text, occupying the remaining. Case, creating the context of the Hall of Judgment around the deceased who lies inside. The three layers are then to be read from inside to outside, manifesting the successive stages of awakening and resurrection, vindication through judgment and passage into the divine, as the vaulted top of the outer coffin symbolically represents the heavens, and the solar barks are depicted there, owed by company. And this is just to, to show you how the elements of the coffin assemblage can be related to these different um, parts of the awakening. These ensembles represent the most explicit statements of the role of the judgment of the dead in the regeneration process. Probably no coincidence when the judgment is depicted in full detail again the elusive references of the Mart and Bennu images or on the throats earlier on, uh, they no longer appear. They're omitted because their function is now supplied through other images and texts more explicitly. Little later, the scene of weighing the heart and the presentation to the judge moves back to the innermost coffin and is given a prominent place on the breast. It's now simplified, yet throughout the 26th dynasty, remains one of the indispensable images of coffin iconography. It is often the only specific scene from the Book of the Dead repertoire which remains in use in this context. 
Uh, so there you've got um, Amelia Coffin, uh, to those who know the Marlocks Museum, uh, with the band across the breast, showing the judgment. This time it's the inner coffin rather than the middle coffin. The middle coffin has reverted now to a simpler design because it's the inner one that's receiving the all important uh, imagery of judgment. In 525 BC, Egypt fell under the rule of the Persian Empire. The next century is poorly represented by well dated and contemporary ensembles. In the fourth century BC, native born Egyptian rulers began to recover their independence. And for four centuries, either through continuity of tradition or revival of older models, we have once more coffins and papyri study. These reveal a picture in which the Book of the Dead was again a chief source of mortuary texts and images. And these were placed mainly on papyri and also directly on the linen mummy wrap. The spells and the vignette of the judgment are again prominent, but they don't appear on the coffin, which now have a similar, simpler repertoire designs. One is forced to question how much of this sacred matter was down, now really understood. Some of the papyri, although written with great care, are full of errors of wording, which would have negated any magical efficacy which they were supposed to get. The Book of the Dead on Papyrus finally ceased production after the Roman conquest. At that time, Judgment made its last fleeting appearance on Egyptian and probably these images were copied from earlier examples. This is one of the very last known instances. Uh, you see the balance there again. Uh, you see Anubis. And interestingly, the, uh, the two eyes are also visible uh, underneath the uh, arm of the balance. Uh, whether that alludes to that much earlier idea of uh, restoring the site of the dead as part of the judgment, we don't know, but um, that re-emerge right at the last moment before the judgment scene out of view. The spread of Christianity throughout Egypt finally extinguished all of this, together with most other elements of Pharaonic mortal tradition. To conclude then, we've seen that the conception of a judgment of the dead evolved slowly in Egypt, with its emergence as a fully articulated notion at the beginning of the New Kingdom, and in particular the image of the weighing of the heart, it became one of the most crucial elements of mortuary belief. It's a concept which passed through a remarkable range of media, from the spoken words of ritual, through papyrus, to the walls of the tomb, the immediate covering of the body and the surface of the coffin. We've seen how the theme of judgment itself passes through a life cycle, expanding and contracting to occupy different surfaces and spaces, adapting and changing its focus as its role as an element of larger belief changed, and undergoing periodic regeneration through the revival of past models. And not least interesting for us today, it is, of course, a direct legacy to the belief systems of our modern. Thank you. Thank you very much, John, for this fascinating deep dive into the change in symbolism of the Judgment of the Dead scene. Um, we have a number of questions up. Um, if you would be kind enough to answer. Um, I just want to say that, you know, because we are separated by thousands of miles, um, the sound seems to be going in and out. So would you just be, would you be kind enough just to speak directly into the uh, microphone of your computer? And I think that should probably take care of, uh, should take care of the issue. So I'm going to, I'm going to start from the, oh goodness. Yeah, we have a lot here. Um, how about this? Um, would a coffin have been painted by one artist or would it be a group effort? Is there any evidence of artist recognition signature? Um, it's pretty certain that most coffins would be painted by teams. Um, from the New Kingdom, we've got records uh, of people making coffins, craftsmen producing them. 
and uh, there's one interesting scene in a tomb showing coffins being made uh, and it's it's happening in a, a context of production of a, a wide range of different objects in the tomb. So um, sometimes in fact on coffins you can tell that you've got different artist hands. Uh, the figures on one side are slightly different in style to the figures on the other. The inscriptions look different on both sides. Sometimes you've got um, the, the, the but the kind of paint can differ on different parts of the coffin. So generally it would be a, a team effort, certainly, yes. Great, great. Um, this, this is, a, so someone asked, uh, do you have a favorite coffin? Um, and also, uh, is there an evolution of thought? Like, for example, did the various pharaohs play any role in the changes or improvements of the scene through millennia? And I'm just gonna tack on to that if, if, if I can. Um, I find it incredibly interesting that the weighing of the heart scene appears during the reign of Amenhotep III, um, you know, in Theban tomb painting. And I wonder, you know, if, if, if that, if there's some, some uh, meaning to that whatsoever. And I'm talking about the tomb of, of uh, um, Horem Heb and also the tomb of Mena. Right. Um, the, the point about who is direct, who is driving the changes, that's something we'd really like to know more about. Um, I think obviously um, the priesthood uh, are evolving different ways of, uh, of representing belief as time goes by, whether the king, uh, whether you know, people um, in political authority are influencing the developments is very difficult to tell. Uh, it is interesting that in the period that I've been talking about, there is this very drastic change in coffin style between the 21st and 20th dynasties. Um, it's the only time really when a big change seems to coincide with a political change the ruling house changes. Um, and at the time the new coffin styles suddenly appear, you have the emergence of a very strong ruler from a new royal family, Shechem I. And it's been speculated as to whether this is one moment where political influence is coming in. It's thought that up to that point, maybe people, non-royal individuals were kind of uh, taking over too many of the, the privileges of um, the royal burial outfit, perhaps taking over too many of the images and texts that should have been reserved for the king. Possibly the king at this moment steps in and said, okay, back on. But this is speculation. Unfortunately, we don't know very much. Uh, the thing about the, uh, the date at which the judgment appears in the tombs, yeah, it's quite interesting. Um, whether there is uh, a, a development here because of the rapidly advancing ideas uh, in religion more generally during the reign of Amenhotep III, um, difficult to say, but it could well be, I think, yes, that... Um, that there is a reflection of the bigger changes going on in Egypt. As well. And someone said, did I have a favorite coffin? Um, <laughs> I've got lots of them, but uh, one of the ones I showed you just a moment ago, um, what the, the one with the, uh, <clears throat> the weighing of the heart across the breast and then all the declaration of innocence below, the very brightly colored one, that's in the British Museum. Uh, that is a particular favorite. It's a beautifully, designed um, solution, I think, to the problem of combining this text and image on one. That's great. Well, a number of people are asking, um, let me just pull this up. Um, do we know of any cases where a heart fails um, the test against the feather? And what, and what would happen in, the, in that instance? Um, well, of course, all of these texts and images are designed to produce the right outcome. Mm -hmm. And so they never show, or hardly ever do they show um, someone failing the test. There is actually an image, a uh, very late one, I think it's early Roman, which shows the judgment going on. And obviously the owner of the tomb, uh, he's passing safely through judgment, but you also see uh, some people who evidently failed. 
uh, who were being devoured by Amut, the, the devouring monster. The, these people are shown as little kind of silhouette, spindly silhouette-like figures, almost as if they're um, almost like kind of shriveled bodies, and they are being eaten. So uh, the possibility of that thing was obviously there as a real, a real threat in people's minds. Uh, but we don't know of any documented case where someone thought that the person had failed the best, you know, and perhaps was bring torments in the next world. <laughs> well, it, it is fascinating that it, you know, the, the, the heart is always portrayed as being lighter than a feather. Um, and in Damnatio Memoriae, uh, you know, they, they would come in and just hack out the heart, um, just doing away, you know, with, uh, with the judgment completely and, uh, and, the, and the person's, um, you know, the person's moral fiber, I guess you could say. Let's see, let's see, let's see what else we have here. Um, Okay, um, all right, this is a little bit off topic, but um, uh, someone asks, um, your sample coffins did not seem to have the common eyes of Horus lateral to the mummy's head. Um, is that another feature which waxed and waned historically? Uh, yes, it did. So the, the pairs of eyes on the side, close to the head, that's something which you find in the late Old Kingdom, the Middle Kingdom, going into the Second Intermediate. It, it survives into the beginning of the New Kingdom, around the time that the Book of the Dead is coming in. Um, and at that point also, the shape of coffins changes. They're generally rectangular in the early period, then they become mummy-shaped. Um, and when they change to the mummy shape, for a little while, you still get these two eyes painted on the side, and then they disappear. Um, and occasionally, they will just pop up again from time to time. You get them just now and again in the 26th dynasty. Um, they don't really fit into the uh, conceptual scheme of the coffin decoration at that period, but the Egyptians were always very keen on hedging their bets and putting different uh, possible ideas about the afterlife together. Um, so it could be that someone revived that idea uh, at a time long after it, its real function was, uh, was obsolete. Well, along that same uh, line of reasoning or the, along that same um, line of questioning, um, is it significant that on the coffin of Naktef Mut, a small figure of Ma'at is located in the center of the deceased chest where the heart would be? Is that significant? Um, you're referring to one of the ones that I showed, is that right? Yes, yes. Um, yeah, the, the Ma'at figure is it would be an example of the, um, the I was talking about, where you, you have marked there to indicate that the person has passed through the judgment. Um, so I think that's the reason for that. Okay. And this is probably a very far ranging question, but I, I, I might as well just um, uh, put it out there. And this, this probably will be the, the last question that we have time for. Um, but uh, the question is, did other world cultures influence the concepts of Egyptian afterlife or were they relatively original? Also, how much did the Egyptian ideas of the afterlife influence other religions, especially the ancient Israelites? That's a big one. Wow. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay, taking the first part of the question, I think most of ancient Egyptian religion was original the Nile Valley. Um, after all, that when we get the first records of Egyptian belief, there is only one other part of the world where there's any writing at all, uh, and that is in uh, Mesopotamia. Uh, they have rather different afterlife belief. So <clears throat> it does look as though the Egyptians evolved most of their ideas independently. Um, and as for how they influenced other cultures, um, I don't believe there is a strong influence on religious Israel. Um, I mean, the idea of the judgment, of course, and reward and punishment, that does go forward into other religions, whether it's coming directly from Egypt or whether it's 
something which has evolved independently in different regions, that's that's quite difficult to say. Um, you know, there are certain details, particularly in Egyptian iconography, that we can suspect have passed into later cultures. Um, one interesting thing about the judgment scene is that um, in some of the later versions, you see um, Mart bringing the dead person into the judgment, shown as a female figure, uh, but her face is turned away. You see the back of her head. And you don't see her face at all. Um, and it's been speculated that this could be the origin of the idea of blind justice, the idea that the female figure that we know of just wears a blindfold. He doesn't see um, what it is that she is judging. It's just possible that there is a, a link there, an iconographical survival um, from ancient Egypt to the present day. That is fascinating. Um, so, uh, Dr. Taylor, thank you so so much for this um, for this lecture. Uh, also, thank you all for your questions, which um, were wide ranging and 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 very topical. Um, and uh, you certainly, John, have earned yourself a pint now. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you very much, everybody.